You are listening to a broadcast by the HaloCourses.com channel. My name is Robert Fain. Our topic today is the power and importance of the stories that we share through mass media or maybe within the religious community, the stories of the Bible or the Quran. What is the importance of these stories for our experience? You are listening to a recording of one of the lessons that I gave on the Preply.com system. Excellent! Um, let's say I have these experiences. Now, if I simply go through them, um, then that's it. They have been effective, they have worked something within you, they've maybe helped you cope with your misery, and that's it. But what if in these 3,000 years of human history, people um, gave you the ability to cling on to that dream or the vision, to give it some kind of interpretative framework. Let's say you're not, you're not calling, calling it a dream, you're not calling it a deep sleep, you're calling it a vision. You are talking uh, about that vision in terms of an encounter with some deity. Um, and that deity is known to you in the sense that you know the stories that your people, your community shares uh, with each other. People in the community share that with each other. There's some kind of framework um, that gives meaning to such an encounter. All of a sudden, your very private, dreamlike experience becomes something shared, becomes something that has meaning through the storytelling of your community and now it becomes some, something that may activate you um, it may show you some kind of direction in your life and maybe that translation of this very personal individual experience into this um, uh, this element of the storytelling of your community makes it indeed very beneficial for you way more than just having the experience that you had a bad dream because you felt so miserable. What if that is the psychological mechanism uh, of religion? What if religion critique would be something like, well, is the story that the community is telling you really beneficial for you? Um, while, uh, uh, while it is... Um, uh, helping you to make sense of your inner experiences. Is it beneficial to you? Or will it lead to a, um, an unbearable sense of guilt and shame? Or will it lead to you feeling uh, totally disconnected from your community? Religion critique would not be, is it true or not? Religion critique would be like, is it beneficial or not? Does it help you survive in this world? Um, as an individual, and does it help you connect with your community? That is the kind of perspective that he has. Uh, that's why he quotes Freud and he quotes Jung, he quotes these great psychologists, um, to make religion um, understandable and also to have some kind of criterion with which to approach the stories that religion um, has to tell us or is telling us all the time. And from that perspective, in the first chapter, he goes on to consider a couple of these myths and stories that help us um, organize our experiences and give meaning to our experiences, even provoke those experiences. I mean, if you uh, really live with a text, uh, I mean, that can be true in a novel as well. It certainly was valid for me when I was reading um, The Lord of the Rings. It was so exciting and so exhilarating, and I couldn't, couldn't <laughs> go. Um, but I started also uh, retelling my own life in those terms. Uh, I started connecting with some of the characters in an interesting way. I was starting to think about who would I like to play if this were a movie, or uh, with what character would I identify the most? And those are interesting questions. It helps me organize then my own experiences and give meaning to it. That is the, uh, I mean, the function of, of great literature, is it not? 
isn't that something that you experience as well? This, there are some novels that stick to you. You you reread them two, three, four times. You really want to not just be acquainted with the book, but you would you would like to absorb it into yourself. Do you have that kind of experiences? Yeah, I mean, um, because then it becomes really necessary for you to to read the Lord of the Rings <laughs> if you didn't didn't already uh, have that kind of. But that is what literature can do. Or a movie, or a poem, or uh, some people would say, well, a certain singer and, and, and uh, a kind of um, repertoire uh, he or she uh, is singing can connect with you on a very deep level. And what that does, what that does is it organizes your experiences in a new fashion, makes you look at yourself in a new fashion, and it gives you roles uh, to identify with. It gives you paths to take in your life. It gives you confidence to make decisions of in making decisions um, well if that is true for great literature in general um, maybe even more in the great religious literature why because that literature is really deeply um, uh, a, a part of your community the community in which you grow up and with, with which you identify if you belong to a church, that is obviously what happens. Eh? You identify with that community. They are your brothers and your sisters. It's like a new kind of family to you. Um, and you share the stories. You know, you, if I meet someone in the train and he turns out to be a Christian, I know I can talk to him about Abraham or Sarah, or, and he can tell me about his life, and I can say, well, it's just like, just like Joseph, what you're telling me, or it's just like, and I can uh, remind them of a story that we share. Even if I don't know him, he comes from a different city, maybe he has a different accent, but we have this connection through the shared stories of our community. So it's, it's also a tool, um, uh, although that is secondary, but it's also a tool for communication. You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. But that is also something that I, um, I'm, I'm deeply worried about, that our culture is like uh, infected more by Hollywood um, uh, ideas and Hollywood suggestions than by anything else. But there are other series that they also like, which are a bit more disturbing than these two comedies, like um, the NCIS stories and the, I mean the, the um, police uh, Police series, um, uh, NCIS, Las or CIS Las Vegas, and CIS. Uh, uh, those stories have something to do with morality, also. Uh, they you teach... mean CIA? No, no CIS. CIS. Um, I don't know what the What's abbreviation that? stands for, actually. Okay. Um, Central Intelligence, whatever, um, something like that. Not CIA, but um, some derivation from it. They're just. Um, um, the detectives trying to solve the most difficult murder cases. But there's a lot of, let's say, implied morality in it. That's also true for comedy. Um, but in this case, it's uh, it has more weight. Eh? I mean, you're, we were talking about crimes, and then sometimes some kind of criminal is shown as being very um, interesting, um, obviously. And but secondly, also sympathetic. Um, so you, you get you get feelings of sympathy for people, for instance, who um, uh, commit fraud, which is a crime. Um, but they are shown to be uh, well. They have they have the good intention. Uh, so that's the way to to lessen the idea of a crime in in such a way. Um, there is some kind of social political philosophy behind all of that isn't necessarily true. Um, what you need in such cases, I mean, that's that my second point would be, I, I share your concern because of the kind of values that are also transmitted. Um, and that you, I mean, let's face it, Hollywood isn't Shakespeare. Huh? I mean, it's not uh, the highest form of literature. But secondly, what you need then is a kind of counter story. A counter argument. You know that many people will love the Rambo movies, eh? You know That's about true. Rambo, it's a, no. quite long ago, but their, their story is about this hero that is 
um, humiliated and then he turns to violence and he gets everything right again, he kills all his enemies and in the end uh, he, he quiets down and that's it. So the story of the humiliated hero that takes revenge, that's a very typical Hollywood story as well. Now in mm-hmm. acting out that revenge, uh, many of these episodes and there are victims that have nothing to do with the quarrel that they have. So, for instance, um, he, he's ta- he takes revenge by shooting a bazooka um, or some missile at a, um, um, the car of the of the bad guys that are uh, following him. And of course, the bad guys get it; they die. But also, ten innocent bystanders die. Well, that's okay. It, it's almost as if in such an episode we find um, 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 a, a minimized um, uh, story about what the United States is sometimes doing in war. And so they, they bomb the hell out of some Afghanistan leader and they take out 25 women and children as well that have nothing to do with the war. Um, that's something awful. However, if you desensitize people by showing in an ordinary Hollywood sitcom or a series that such a thing, I mean, that, that's the hero taking revenge, and of course there are innocent bystanders, but um, that's okay, yeah, because the, the, uh, um, the task of getting your revenge is so highly important that it may cost the life of lives of people that are not involved if you imprint that on people through these series that are so well made and they are so interesting to watch and you're watching them with 50% of your brain active eh? after a long day's work people sit down, they have their beer, they sit in front of the television and they see the hero that they love taking revenge and uh, alas there are 10 innocent bystanders who die as well then they see the news and they see the missile going into the Afghanistan village killing this crook, this bad guy, and taking out 100 innocent bystanders. Well, that's okay, because the hero, of course, is the missile, is the US. The the um, political um, structure of the news flash is similar to the um, story about the uh, the hero that has first been um, badly uh, badly humiliated and then obviously has to take revenge. So it sort of transfers, or not transfers, um, it transforms your way of looking at the wars of America by um, showing you um, in a digestible form the basic psychological structure of it, which is the hero taking revenge. And you love that, and you like that, and you sympathize with it, and then comes the news, then you, you start loving the missile. Because that's a symbolic representation of the hero you've just been watching in the Hollywood series. You see so, what I mean? Yeah, well, well, what's the difference between the hero in Hollywood movies and the hero in classical literatures? The, the, let, let's look at Shakespeare. Are you familiar with Shakespeare at all? Not very, but I know a little. Well, let's say we have um, uh, the story of the tragedy of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. You know about Hamlet. I I saw the movie of that. Oh, you saw the movie. Perfect. Yes. Um, Then you watched for three hours, I think. I I, I think I know the same movie that you have watched. Um, Yeah. Um, But look at the difference between Hamlet and Rambo. the violence of Rambo that is continuing because he has so much revenge to do that ends with um, his former colonel, 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 colonel? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that, is his superior in the war, uh, and he is redrafted into the military. <clears throat> and all is forgiven. I mean, he have, has just blown up half of the village, um, and he has killed a couple of guys, uh, that have um, ordered him to to go go away. They don't want to have Vietnam uh, veterans in that village, and that's why they send them away. And then he comes back, and he gets into an argument and a fist fight, and he gets locked up. And then he, uh, I mean, 
all of that is coming from this Vietnam veteran that we sympathize with because he is dealt unfairly. But the end of it is that he is vindicated and his violence is forgiven. Now take a look at Hamlet. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is... Excellent! You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. Uh, Hamlet experiences the death of his father through the hands of his uncle, who then marries his mother. And now he has to make a choice. Can he stand up against his uncle and kill that uncle and, and have all sorts of problems, obviously, his mother won't like it. Or can he some, somehow um, um, uncover the, um, the crime of his uncle? Um, in, in the end, he dies. This is not a good ending. He's not vindicated. Um, actually, this hero um, shows a fatal flaw, as it's called. Uh, every time you, you read literature about Shakespeare, you notice this word fatal flaw. There's a fatal flaw in the character of each of the heroes in Shakespeare's uh, tragedies. Um, and the fatal flaw in, in Hamlet is procrastination and doubt. He knows what is the right thing and he can't get himself to do it. He keeps doubting it. Um, and ultimately when he um, does um, kill his, uh, his uncle, he has killed himself. Because his uncle realizes that uh, his nephew is a mortal danger, and then um, he um, he poisons the cup from which Hamlet is drinking, and he poisons the tip of the blade of Laertius that is fighting with him in a mock duel. Um, and uh, the effect of all of that is that Hamlet, but also his mother, drink from the poisoned cup. So that's not the intention of the uncle, the uncle now experiences the death of his wife um, by his own hand because he poisoned the cup that his mother drinks from. But Hamlet also dies. And that's the end not only of, uh, um, of Hamlet and the king, his uncle, and his mother, but it's also the end of Denmark. It's a tragedy also at political level because now um, the whole kingdom is taken over by the enemies of Denmark because there is no king and there is no queen and there is no successor to the throne, etc. Now that that is a hero. Why is that a hero? Because of the um, the the depth of his soul and the um, uh, the honesty with which he approaches himself. Huh? He knows about his own procrastination, his doubts, and then you have this famous soliloquy. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler to take arms against the sea of trouble and by opposing end them, uh, or to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and by opposing, no, no, not, about, not by opposing end them. Um, but let's say that that's the difference. To be a hero and fail, or to be a coward and live. To be or not to be. And the question of putting your life on and the line for some truth that you find really um, important, that is his whole question. He, he can't figure it out, which makes him a human hero. And in the case of Rambo, it makes him a psychotic hero that we can sympathize with a little bit. But he's psychotic. He should have been in some kind of psychiatric ward for this idea that he has to take revenge to the point of... Um, destroying half a village uh, to get his revenge. Um, Hollywood produces, therefore, the anti-story to Shakespeare. And Shakespeare um, actually showed us a human hero um, who is a hero in intent, a hero in his, his delicate sentiments, a hero in his understanding of this situation. And uh, he's even a hero in combating his own inner doubts. Um, whereas Rambo has no inner doubts whatsoever. Um, and that's the Hollywood idea. You, you don't have doubts. You don't procrastinate. You take up arms against the sea of troubles, period. That's what you do. So what Shakespeare, what Hamlet's, Hamlet, uh, what Shakespeare's Hamlet is um, thinking about is something that um, Rambo will never think about. 
he will simply act. And that is kind of the American idea. Don't think, act. The truth is that with the power of Jesus Christ, you can be normal. Excellent. You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. Mm. Whereas in the Britain of, of Shakespeare, this, um, let's say, this, this advertisement for reflection is very important. For the reflective life, um, as you might say, uh, which is uh, basic, basic to all uh, philosophy, that the reflective life is worth living, and not so much the active and, and practical life uh, that should be informed by and guided by the, uh, the power of thought and reflection. Shakespeare's heroes, therefore, I think, are way deeper and way more human than are the, the silicone uh, version heroes that we have in Hollywood. Now, who is influenced by Shakespeare? Maybe less than, just less than 1% of uh, the whole population. Who is influenced by Rambo? I think the other 91%, 99%. So the story that we share as a community is the story of Rambo and not the story of Hamlet. Whereas it would be beneficial, more beneficial to our societies if we would share the story of Shakespeare, the story of Hamlet. See what I mean? Because to understand that heroic attempts might, might fail, that there is reason for contemplation and doubt, that that is not a weakness, but a strength actually to be able to doubt, to be able to consider um, the merits of some action, etc. Um, that is the kind of value that I would like to share with my, uh, with my community. And not so much the value that uh, if you feel humili humiliated, just just um, destroy the village. So we are getting Americanized to the bone. Uh, the morality of young people is formed more by uh, such uh, uh, series than by anything other than that. Um, and then they get Shakespeare in, in high school and they get bored easily because what what is happening here? There's a hero that dies. How is it possible? And they prefer a hero that doesn't die. Remember Trump saying um, about um, John McCain, I prefer heroes that, does, that don't get captured. Remember that, that he said John McCain was a hero, a war hero, because he was captured and he was kept, I think, for a couple of years uh, in imprisonment and then he was released. And he uh, got a, a Medal of Honor because he was so steadfast, so... Uh, he didn't lose his integrity during that captivity. And then Donald Trump said, um, well, I prefer a hero that does not get captured. And that was the voice, in this case by a president, um, that was the voice of the Hollywood story that the hero turns out to be a real hero because he triumphs. So in this case, it was heroism of um, endurance, but endurance in humility is not the American dream. Overcoming your enemies and um, not fighting to your death, but fighting to their death. And that's what the American dream is all about. And Trump was merely reflecting that sentiment that many people had. Oh, that can't be a true hero. A hero can't be the one that has been in captivity for so long. And of course, in real life, if you reflect upon it, that can certainly be a form of heroism, not to give up and to accept your very difficult circumstances and to survive um, all kinds of psychological and physical um, torture. Uh, yeah, I believe that to be quite heroic. But that's Shakespe Shakespearean tragedy. That, that's Shakespearean uh, heroism. It's not Hollywood uh, heroism. And he reflected those yeah, those um, Hollywood-like values when he said, I prefer someone who, who doesn't get captured. I'm hoping there's a logical explanation for all this. Excellent! You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. Well, a coward who doesn't go to the front line also doesn't get captured. But that doesn't make him a hero, right? Okay, I have a point? question. Mm, yep. So, 
the the problem of the character of Rambo is like he never gets captured and he he, he never dies. Uh, it looks like 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 he uh, he he doesn't pay anything for his yes uh, heroic deeds. Exactly. Um, but but what what about uh, characters like Iron Man? Uh, like that, that oh, very, yeah. very rich uh, superheroes uh, who pays a lot of money for his success. Does that make sense? Um, well, it's a sort of glorification of his wealth, uh, just like Batman. Uh, he has inherited the wealth of his parents. Um, it's like the the story of the the wealthy and the rich that. Um, instead of being simply concerned with themselves, they reach out to help others. That's a famous kind of, um, it's called a tropey in, in um, li uh, literature studies. It's, it's as ancient as the Middle Ages. Um, let's say if you're a poor girl helping your neighbor, you're nothing. But what if you're a lady at the court of a king and you help poor people by bringing them food and you yourself go through the mud with, with your fine clothes in order to help others. Then you're a heroine. Or, as the Middle Ages would say, you're a saint. Because you come from a high station and you bow down to the lower areas of society to help others. Now, it's important because you come from up on high, so it's voluntary. You choose for it. The, the, um, most of the supernatural heroes um, they have some privilege that they have to give up in order to reach down to help the, the needy. They are immensely wealthy or they're immensely powerful. And instead of using that power for themselves, they use it for others. But that ha has also a, a political uh, foundation, a political uh, foundational structure. It represents the kind of politician that we prefer. Why was Trump so interesting for many voters, I believe? Because he was seen as this wealthy, successful businessman who gave up his um, privileged position in order to serve the people by becoming a president. That's why he said so many times in his rhetoric, I'm not earning any money. I'm giving back my fee um, to the state um, uh, at, the, at the same time earning immensely uh, because of his presidency and because of the connections between his corporation and, and the presidency. Um, but this idea that someone who is so wealthy and could live for himself um, and now takes our needs into account, he wants to help us, that's such a powerful myth that it immensely helped his uh, his election. But that's, a, that's an ancient kind of story that he's told since the Middle Ages, you come from high. I mean, it, it, it even has some kind of ground in the Christian basic story, in the Christian gospel, um, because Christ is also considered to be the Son of God, who doesn't need to become human, he doesn't need to be sacrificed, but he chooses so voluntarily in order to um, redeem mankind. So it's it's like a Christ story. Um, and if if you apply that to people like Trump or to Iron Man or to Batman or to Spider-Man, uh, it's always the same. By some fortune, um, some people get this natural or, or the supernatural abilities. They uh, do not exercise that power for themselves, but for others. I mean, that's, that's like a, a, a politician's um, um, story. And politicians will tap into that. I mean, that's the reason that Trump in his rhetoric emphasized so much that he gave up everything in order to be president. I mean, the presidency as the ultimate way to serve others. But that's part of the myth. That's part of the stories you share. In Christianity, uh, in principle, um, you must say, well, that means accepting suffering. If you come from on high like Christ and you do your redeeming work that that implies suffering uh, not like Rambo but like Hamlet uh, more, more or less well, a bit a bit like Hamlet um, it, it, it means sharing the the position sharing the misery 
of the people that you want to uh, redeem. Now, Trump didn't share the misery of the people that he wanted to redeem. And, and neither did those ladies in the Middle Ages that came from um, the, the royal court to help the needy. I mean, they, at the end of the day, they went back home and they had all this luxury. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is... Excellent. You are listening to a broadcast by the HaloCourses.com channel. Um, they didn't share their wealth. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they gave to the uh, to the poor, but they never forgot their own interests. That's a huge difference. So we we like, therefore, we in our shared stories, we like someone who pays attention to those in need, but at the same time remains rich. Um, um, it, it's like the uh, what is he called again? The Microsoft uh, boss. Um, who earns, uh, let's say, a billion a year and then gives 100 million uh, to charity, and then we applaud him as a hero. We forget about the 900 million that he still keeps for himself. We like that idea. I mean, yeah, you can keep that. You work hard. You earn, uh, uh, let's say, a billion a year. Um, but um, we don't question that. We don't question this obscenity of uh, this enormous... Um, uh, profit that he makes, uh, we don't question that. We applaud the fact that he gives something up of that for uh, for other people, for uh, charitable work. Why is that possible? Why is it possible that we accept that? Well, because the Hollywood stories prepare us for that. They lay the foundation for our acceptance of such a situation. That is what I believe. And that's why there is, in these sitcoms and comedies, with, there's so much to enjoy because they're made very cleverly and they uh, they appeal, appeal to me very much. I love watching them. But at the same time, there is a sub-level in all of these series that profoundly um, uh, worries me. Not just the fact that they are watched so intensely that some people just can't get their eyes off the screen. Um, and you can come, become addicted to them. Um, that's not the first reason I'm worried about them. I'm worried about the subtext, the message that is coming along with it, and especially in the CIS or NCIS stories, um, where there is um, some morality being being taught. Now, what I just presented to you is sometimes called ideology critique. It's part of uh, political and social philosophy. Um, it's the 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 um, the attempt to understand the sub-layers of our cultural uh, cultural communication, and it has a, a, a an interesting connection to theology and philosophy of religion, because religious stories attempt to do the same, provide a subtext in which we can put our own experiences and try to understand them. Now, what if the ultimate Christian story is in opposition to the story that is shared throughout your um, political society. What then? Well, you have sometimes a complete submission of the Christian story to the prevailing community story. I think that has happened in the United States, and that is what called public theology. Public theology is any kind of theology that seen, that that um, attempts to uh, simply um, incorporate or uh, advance or affirm the values that are present in society. So they want to adapt to whatever is prevalent in society. And you have the other kind, which is to use the story as a counter-narrative, as an alternative. Um, the example I gave you from Shakespeare is also in, in let's say, in, in the Bible. I mean, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the great patriarchs of the book of Genesis, and Joseph, they're losers. Joseph is a loser. I mean, he is so arrogant that his brothers will sell him to the Egyptians, and then in Egypt, uh, he almost um, gets uh, tempted um, by um, the wife of his employer, and then he gets into jail innocently, so he's a loser. Um, and then all of a sudden, he... Um, uh, has some vital information for the king of Egypt 
and he is raised from the prison to become the viceroy of Egypt. So you have, first you have the downfall and then you have the elevation of the hero. That's the Joseph story. It's the only story that ends well um, of all the patriarchs. And, and then after that, the story of Israel as a, as a nation begins in the book of Exodus. But in Genesis, you have these psychological typologies most of the time of someone who ultimately fails. Um, a, a hero that is not so much um, triumphing, but really has to give something up. The Abram story. What does Abram have to give up? Well, he turns out to be uh, um, or, or he, he marries uh, a woman, his, his um, second cousin, uh, Sarah, and Sarah is infertile. She doesn't uh, give him a son, so there is no heir. And then God promises them an heir, but they will have to wait a lot of time for that. And Sarah even is beyond the age of childbearing, but still she becomes pregnant. She, they get that son. And then after that son has grown up to be about 25, Abram gets the commandment to sacrifice his son. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is... Excellent! You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. To kill his son, therefore, actually. Now there you have the situation of Shakespearean uh, tragedy. There's, there's no winner here. In the Quran, when Muhammad rewrote those stories, he left all of that out. Everything that makes Abraham a tragic hero, a hero that had to go through doubts and temptations and problems, he simply leaves it out and it becomes a triumphant story of Abraham, not with Isaac, but with Ishmael. So Muhammad felt that, you, you can't tell that to my Arab tribes, that um, God is able to tempt you like that, and that Maybe the value of life is not so much in triumphing and winning, but the, the value of life lies somewhere um, in the possibility uh, of giving something up, of sacrifice. Um, not just part of you, but your whole future. So there is no story about the sacrifice of Isaac in the Quran. They, they left it out. He left it out, Muhammad. So did you just say that God in Quran uh, doesn't attempt people. Uh, he, uh, he, no, he doesn't tempt people in that in that way. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Mm. So, um, see what I mean. I mean, let, let's say um, the main thing I was saying is stories um, help us understand and um, live out of this very deep sources of our personality, yeah? like dreams. Um, dream life is part of that. Um, uh, what we think is the highest or what we sort of, um, uh, well, thinking is not the word I'm looking for. What, what we assume to be the highest or what we um, at some level perceive to be the highest thing, something to be aspire to. Uh, so our, the life of our ambitions and aspirations, our vision of the future. There are some things in our individual life that are so deep that we barely scratch the surface if we try to express that. And then there's the second layer of the communal stories that help us um, focus on these sources of our personality, the sources also of energy in our life. And then there is the question, well, what kind of story is beneficial and to what extent? And that's where religion comes in because religion most of the time gives us either either a story that conforms to society uh, at large or it gives us a minority alternative story and with it it brings it a totally new way of looking at your own experiences looking at your triumphs and your defeats um, and Shakespeare was very much oriented toward the Bible and eh? For him, the Bible was a real source of um, of thought, um, and that is the reason that you find so many tragic heroes. And not, I mean, the hero, um, the, the heroism in, in in Shakespeare can be there even in defeat. And I can't think of any character in Shakespeare that actually triumphed. 
if they triumph, there's something wrong with them. The same in Greek tragedy. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about Greek tragedy, but it's very worth uh, worth it to at least read some kind of summary uh, of the different plays that you have. Um, uh, try at least to, to figure out what the Antigone story is all about, simply by finding, maybe on Wikipedia, I don't know, but the, the main the main form of that story, the Antigone, um, the only hero, in brackets, um, uh, in quotation marks, um, the only hero there that survives is the bad king Creon. That's her uncle, Creon, is called. <clears throat> so that, in Hollywood terms, that's the real hero. But in the terms of the Greek tragedy, that is the the worst thing that could happen. That Antigone, who is the real heroine, she dies. She is defeated. And Creon lives, but he's not awarded in that tragedy the status of being the real hero. Here the survivor, the, the, the triumphant guy, actually loses uh, on a moral uh, plane. He turns out to be a villain. Uh, his The way he rules the city of Thebes as a king is not beneficial to that community. And it leads him uh, to um, murder his niece. Antigone is the niece of Creon. Um, so Greek tragedy and Shakespeare, Shakespeare more psychological and Greek tragedy more political, um, they um, they both show us a different kind of hero than Hollywood. Hollywood is the story of the pioneer that comes into um, the United States and moves to the West, kills uh, some Indian tribes, uh, grabs uh, land and becomes successful. That's the, the, the story of the West, it's the pioneer story that Americans tell themselves to, I think, to legitimize what they actually did. What they had actually did was steal a country and perform genocide. That's what they did. Um, so uh, you need some kind of mythology, some kind of narrative to explain that, to justify that, to keep it going. You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. The Republican Party at this moment is retelling uh, American history precisely for that purpose. How can you make an insurrection um, with all this um, violence uh, into a tourist visit by uh, concerned um, patriots? How can you do that? Well, you have to tell a story that makes it fit, that contradicts the facts, that contradicts other stories but that suits you uh, well, um, beneficial to a particular group within American society, but not beneficial to that society as a whole. So there you have it, this art of storytelling to um, create stories in which we can then rediscover or give meaning to our own experiences. That is going on all the time. And religious stories um, should be, I'm on that side of the whole spectrum, they should be um, uh, contrary and critical and opposite the stories that are, uh, are, the myths and the stories that are told in order to protect the status quo, to protect the rich, to protect the powerful, um, etc. And I believe that the biblical story is such a, a, counter, um, a counter story, a counter narrative. And that's, for me, the purpose and the function and the meaning and the importance of religious uh, stories, of religion in, in general. Um, because it does not only addresses your individual experiences, it also addresses the, the common stories in which you um, fit your experiences. It provides an alternative for those experiences. If you experience defeat, <clears throat> within American or Japanese uh, culture, especially Japanese is very strong in this, uh, then you should be ashamed. You're a loser. Right? Mm, if you don't yeah. achieve your ambitions, if you uh, you become a medical doctor and you practice in some um, backward village in, um, um, in, in Kansas or something, 
you're a loser, right? There has to be, if you, uh, per, uh, if they portray people like that, there's always some kind of tragic conflict that they had to, in which they had to lose, they were overcome by the opposition and therefore they, they came to this village and they um, <clears throat> accepted their, their lower position because of that. Um, there's always this idea of a social hierarchy in which the losers are at the bottom and the winners are at the top and that is rightfully so. There's never any criticism of the structures of society or the uh, the way people deal with each other and the um, uh, what some uh, should call uh, indigent, indigent and, and systemic uh, racism that is at work or um, this um, <clears throat> uh, uh, partial uh, acceptance and even legitimization of violence. Um, all of that what is discussed now in the United States is it's like the 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 fabric of the cloth that has been put over all of these problems is now tearing yeah. apart. Um, we see the police brutality, we see racism at work, we see um, weird ways of opposing that, uh, wrong ways of opposing that with counter violence, etc, etc, etc. There's a lot going on now, especially in your country, that, uh, uh, sorry, in the United States, that isn't your country, right? You're in, in you're in Britain. No, I'm in Britain. Yeah, you're in Britain. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so I was confused for for one moment. But in the United States, you have that. Eh? So the 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 protective layer is now getting ripped, um, and people start thinking again about such problems. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is excellent. You are listening to a broadcast by the HegelCourses.com channel. Now, I'm not going to address uh, Britain's problems because they are the same as the Dutch problems and in general we have the same kind of difference between the official stories, the national stories and the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the historic reality on the one hand and then the religious uh, stories on the other hand. In Holland there has been a very long time uh, a conflation between the two, eh? so the religious story um, that was accepted was the liberation of Israel from Egypt and the, the start of a new kingdom and then the Dutch said well we are like that we are like a second Israel so we have to impose biblical law everywhere and we have to rule out any kind of um, uh, difference of opinion uh, we have to fight heresy um, so political life and religious life became one became fused with one another and the same happened in the United States. And then we talk about the public religion or public theology again. Okay, that was a long story on my part. But mm. you, you got it. You got what <laughs> I, I meant. Uh, yes, I, I, I got we're it. We're not even talking about, um, about Peterson. But um, what I recognize when I re read him, that is the same kind of approach that I have explained to you now. Eh? So this emphasis on what does a story do to you? Well, according to Carl Jung, there are uh, uh, basic universal storylines, yeah. like the <clears throat> the ones we talked about the other day, uh, last week, um, with the clock, uh, the the uh, the story clock that Tolkien had uh, um, figured out. Um, that story structure and particular ways of telling such stories, um, according to Jung, belong to a, a kind of common unconscious. Um, a common subconsciousness of humanity. Um, if you're born in Korea or in China or in uh, South America or in Holland, you will share those stories simply by being human. Um, and everywhere, the stories that people tell, the fairy tales that people hear when they grow up, they have the same basic structure. Excellent! 